All right, as we begin this morning, I want to give you a content warning. Um, explicit language. Can I say it that way? Uh, there are young ears present in this room. Perhaps you're streaming live or you are viewing or listening to a recording of this message. I'm going to be addressing the issues related to transgenderism. And that's a big word. It's a loaded word, and, and it comes with a whole host of vocabulary related to the LGBTQIA plus nomenclature. I, I will try to speak in code. I will try to speak above young ears. I will try to speak with delicacy. But you need to know as parents, it is your responsibility to shepherd your children, to protect their innocence, even to keep them from terminology that would set them awry. So this is the content warning up front, <clears throat> and I'm extending and stalling just a little bit so you can get up and leave if you'd like to. <laughs> if you've got earplugs in your pockets or coloring books at your side. I will try to be careful, but we will be dealing with things that might introduce ideas that I would want you to be aware of. We must be clear. We don't want to be so clear as to unnecessarily, prematurely introduce concepts that a thoughtful, intentional parent would want to shepherd at an opportune and appropriate age. But you need to know something as a parent. You cannot be ignorant of the issues we will discuss this morning. The issues at stake in this discussion are all around us. They are ubiquitous in our culture. They, they are everywhere. Transgenderism is almost the air society breathes. And you will have to teach your kids on these issues. <clears throat> what do you make of the sentence... I am a man trapped in a woman's body. Or, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. These were nonsensical statements not long ago. They were jokes. But now the sentence makes sense. It makes sense to people. When they, when they hear it, it has meaning. It has significance. And, and we understand what people mean when they say it. What has happened? This idea has gone from a joke to a contagion. We have a Supreme Court justice who is a woman and a very intelligent one who is unable, and I would say unwilling, to answer the question, what is a woman? There was a decent collegiate male athlete that has pretended to be a woman and to dominate women's collegiate swimming. Everywhere you turn, the playing field for women in sports and other competitive endeavors has all but been erased by men pretending to be women entering those competitions. Spaces for women in our society and culture, distinctives for women in our society and culture have all but been erased. Men are winning awards for woman of the year in so many venues. Some of us remember Bruce Jenner, the Olympian who decided to pretend to be a woman. And all of these things sort of normalize that which is atrocious, aberrant, unnatural, and it has become a fad, a, an easy social contagion spreading like wildfire on the internet, through the internet, in normal, polite society. It's cool to be different. It's cool to be rebellious. It's good to be authentic. And all of a sudden, transgenderism seems like it's everywhere. And if you get on this bandwagon, you can find emotional support against the oppressive regimes of conscience and of nature and of biology and of your parents and especially of those traditions that have marked humanity's past 
all of humanity's past, except for perhaps the last few minutes, it seems. The emotional support you can receive comes from confused peers and conniving predators. That support comes from celebrities and influencers, from entertainers and teachers, online support groups, and a seemingly unending parade of miscreants who seem hell-bent on warping other people's minds for their own nefarious purposes. You can now alter your chemistry and mutilate your body in a vain attempt to conform your physical reality to your mental and emotional confusion. Doctors are more than ready to be paid to help you, and drug providers are more than ready to have you as a lifelong customer. You can even find support among religious groups, some of them calling themselves Christian, who are ready to let you know that God affirms your confusion and your perversion. This is a reshaping of cultural norms. And the reshaping of cultural norms and the onset of puberty and access to pornography and peer contagion can all contribute to confusion in the individual. We must recognize that anybody that's caught up in perpetrating or participating in transgenderism is simultaneously victim and perpetrator. A victim of the blindness that the God of this world has done in this world. A victim of society's caving to rampant selfishness. A victim of the sins of mothers and fathers, permissive and or abusive. And yet we are all perpetrators in this world, victims though we may be. I want to make sense of the nonsensical phenomenon of transgenderism. That's the purpose of our time this morning. How do we make sense of that which is foundationally, utterly nonsensical? I want to attempt that through two avenues. First, I want to look at the, the train of human ideas that has led us here. And then secondly, we want to look at this from God's vantage point. What is God doing in all of this? And then as a third part of our outline this morning, we will look at some solutions. So let's start first with the philosophical. How did we get here? This seems like a sudden, catastrophic, cataclysmic phenomenon that just sort of sneaked up on us, like a crocodile sneaks up on you in the river. You don't see it. It's beneath the surface, and, and you're reaching down to get that fish off of the hook, and the crocodile is there all of a sudden. But I think this is more like the surprise of raising a crocodile from a hatchling in your home and then being surprised one day when that crocodile eats your family. This crazy phenomenon we are at today comes from a long line of human trends and ideas that are related to one another. This isn't a sudden appearance of something new, but the continuation of something very, very old. Let's think about this from the train of human ideas. I'm going to confess to you this morning that I am not a philosopher. I have read philosophy. I have dabbled in some philosophy, and I must confess my negative bias against philosophy. Philosophy, philos, sophos, the, the, the two words together mean a love of wisdom, and shouldn't we all love wisdom? Yes, but the great human enterprise of philosophy, I fear, is far from a love of wisdom. How is wisdom defined, Christian? Where does it begin? The fear of the Lord. How much philosophy over the course of human history has been done with the foundational starting point of fear of the Lord? Very little. I do have a favorite philosopher. It is Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes. And one of his refrains, you may have learned this axiom from Solomon, there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> It's a great refrain. Humanity is what humanity has been since Genesis 3. 
There's not some new problem fundamentally placing, uh, facing humanity. There's not some new constitutional makeup of humanity that has somehow just emerged. Humanity's identity has not evolved. We are who we have been. And the things that come out of the fallen mind today are the same things that are reflected from the fallen minds of humanity as recorded in Scripture. I grant that it is hard to watch Western civilization that has ridden the coattails of a biblical worldview begin to fall apart in our day. But the reality is that biblical worldview was built out of a sea of human depravity by the faithful proclamation and belief in God's word. And humanity has gone in waves back and forth in various times and in various places of subscribing to God's views and rejecting in rebellion God's views. We just happen to be in a waning tide of seeing those things here. It's hard to watch. But first century Corinth was awful. The Roman pantheon was awful. The Grecian immoralities were terrible. The Aztecs sacrificed their kids, the gods of Molech and Asherah and Balaam, are all throughout human history. There truly is nothing new under the sun. We, we are experiencing in our day a downward spiral into what man would naturally make of himself. And we'll get to how God views that in a moment. It seems to me the discipline of philosophy has become a competitive pursuit of trying to say that there is something new under the sun, and I, the philosopher, have found it. If you've ever read philosophy, you know that each philosopher that comes along writes and makes a name for himself on the basis that all other philosophies before him didn't quite get it right. Their view of life, their take on the world, their perspective on how things are or how they ought to be wasn't right. I've got the answer. Right? If some philosopher in the 1700s got it right, that would be the end of philosophy. We would just read that book. My kids read a geometry textbook for their school that's over 2,000 years old. The math hasn't changed. But the philosophies do every week. That should tell you something about the discipline. Again, I'm just giving you my negative bias here. How many philosophers are there? How many philosophy textbooks are there? It should all have been over at fear the Lord. So while I have dabbled in reading philosophy over the years here and there, I must admit that I bore quickly over it. I have a short attention span for it, and I am therefore dependent on others who have drunk deeply of the various schools of philosophy and can give me the Cliff's Notes. This morning, what I hope to do is give you the Cliff's Notes of the Cliff's Notes to a train of philosophical ideas that have led us to this statement, I am a man trapped in a woman's body. For the first half of this equipping hour discussion, I am deeply dependent on Carl Truman and his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I don't know whether or not to commend it to you. I'm just telling you it exists. And, and you can read what I am about to describe to you for about the next 15 minutes in that book if you would like to. While this transgenderism phenomenon seems sudden, it is, in fact, the inevitable result of a long train of human ideas that are connected and they follow one upon the other. Truman says, this sentence, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, is a sentence not long ago that would have been seen as a piece of incoherent gibberish. And yet today it is a sentence that many in our society regard not only as meaningful, but so significant that to deny it or question it is in some way to reveal yourself as stupid, immoral, or subject to some irrational phobia. And so we have this new lingo, transphobic. It's the irrational idea that you would disagree with the transgender phenomenon. Truman makes the contention that 
the train of ideas leading to this had a, a significant shift in the Romantic era. Ro I almost said error, probably close. We'll get to Freud in a second, that may have been a slip. Romanticism was a period of European philosophy, art, culture, music, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that resulted in a new understanding of the self. It removed self from the self's connection to society, that you are a political being or a societal being, that, that you exist in some sense, your identity, your, your definitional constituency has to do with the people around you. You're in a family and you're in a neighborhood and you're joined together in some sort of human governance and, and who you are is defined in some significant measure by the people you're connected to. And Romanticism was built around the idea that self is the determining factor for reality. The identity of self is determined moreover by how you feel. The, the reflection of self, the Rene Descartes, I think therefore I am, sentiment is I define me. My existence is defined and described by my self-perception, by my preferences, by my personal experience and, and how I feel about myself. How I feel about myself is the truth. That is the reality that came out of that philosophical era. And furthermore, that self-truth must be expressed. And that came out in the music of the era and the philosophy of the era and the writings of that era. It's not just enough for you to think about yourself and that's your identity, but that thinking about yourself being your identity has to have an avenue outward. It must be expressed. And the result of that is that everybody else comes to see that your authentic self is as you express it. And so this being true to yourself comes not from objective realities, but from your own self-awareness, your own self-perception, your own self-expression. And then we had Charles Darwin. Another significant shift in the way the world thinks about the world. What was the contribution of Darwin? Darwin basically said, humanity boils down to biology. You are what you are physically, and there is a terminus to your physicality. Dust to dust means you are worm food when it's all done. There's no afterlife to be concerned about. There's no accountability to be worried about. You can think about yourself and you can think about your life apart from God. This was the liberation of self-expression from accountability. It was the liberation of self-expression from deity. It's the liberation of self-expression from categories of right and wrong and sin and righteousness. What did Darwin say motivated humanity? The same thing that motivates all biology. Survival. You just be stronger than the rest. <laughs> and whatever happens to survive will populate the next generation. Darwin gave to the world a, an expression of humanity without reference to the Imago Dei, the image of God in man. Man is made constitutionally in God's image. It therefore belongs to God and is accountable to God, Darwin cut the tether to the image of God and man, cut the tether to moral responsibility, cut the tether to what we would call teleology or your purpose for existence. No longer is your purpose for existence anything bigger than you or outside of you. It's not God, it's not humanity, it's not society around you. Your purpose for existence is you. And Carl Truman says this about the effect on sex from that perspective. He says, while sex may be presented today as little more than a recreational activity, sexuality is presented as that which lies at the very heart of what it means to be an authentic person. And this leads us to Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was the father of psychoanalysis. 
and his Darwinian worldview, he too believed that man was basically an animal. That, that at best, uh, man was biology and needed to be shaped or could be shaped by the influences that he brought to the fore. That psychoanalysis would, would help the self be the self that the self wanted to be. And Sigmund Freud boiled down the self as being primarily sexual. Not only is mankind biology only, Freud said mankind essentially is sexuality only. Everything is an expression in some form or fashion of sexuality. And, and this tied sexuality to identity. You see, no longer is sexuality the outward activities of things that humans do whose identity is rooted in the Imago Dei, the image of God and man. But sexual activity is now who you are. Right? And, and we're seeing this played out in our modern verbiage. I can't change who I am. I was born this way. And, and they're talking about their perversions. Listen, sexual perversion is not the identity of man. It is not the teleology of man. But Darwin and Freud, following on the Romantics, made it so in our cultural conception. So when Christians object to homosexual practice, for instance, this becomes construed as rejecting someone's identity. And do you feel that? The sexual revolution was a, hey, just let everybody do what they want to do. Now it has become the new racial issue, the civil rights issue, the identity issue, the thing bound up in who you are, the things you're born with that you cannot change. And, and how dare you tell me not to be who I am? This is the great new civil rights battle. It's a battle to see someone's perverse activities as rooted in and equal to their identity. And in Christian circles, their identity before God. God made me gay is the new mantra. This is so critical to understand. When Freud tied aberrant sexual behaviors to human identity at the core, he set our culture on a course to normalize and to protect and even celebrate every perversion. The traits you're born with cannot change, therefore they cannot be violated. To try to get somebody to change from their aberrant, perverse sexual behavior would be like trying to get somebody to change the color of their skin. It is that offensive in our culture today. People shouldn't have to even want to change. One more philosopher, the political philosopher we will add here is Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a committed Darwinian, influenced by Freudian thought, Karl Marx, you may be well aware, is the one that popularized this idea of socialism, communism. A man who never worked a day in his life and mooched off of his parents and his friends tried to tell the whole world how to work. The man was a criminal and a miscreant and a demon worshiper and has significantly victimized the world probably in more ways than any other human being we could think of in history. The, the 20th century was a petri dish for Karl Marx and his ideas that resulted in uncountable deaths. What was Marx's idea? On the surface, it was to bring about a utopian society. How would he get there? by class struggle, by envy. You had to convince people that they didn't have what they wanted and a utopia was waiting just around the corner for them if they could get what other people had. And so the government needed to step in and give you the other guy's stuff. 
and when the government won't do that. You need to raise up a band of radicals who will overturn society, in fact, turn society into an anarchist revolution so that there is no government, so people will cry out for government because any government's better than anarchy, and so we are willing to put in a tyrant who will, in fact, steal everybody's stuff and redistribute it to everyone else equally so that everybody can equally have nothing. It's a tragic story. And we might think of Karl Marx only in realms of politics and, and 20th century political experimentation. But the effects of Marx's views are with us. They've been in the college classrooms here since the 1920s. They surfaced politically in the 1950s. You may remember McCarthyism. I think McCarthy was right. There are communists everywhere. But more radically, his views have perpetuated on university campuses in this country for decades. They have showed up in the race wars that have emerged in the last couple of decades. And I would just commend to you Omri's work on Marx's views infiltrating the woke movement. You can go back and look up Omri's Equipping Hour lessons on that. What Marx gave to us was the idea that uh, a class struggle of envy leading to anarchy, leading to tyranny, could give us a utopian society. And what came out of that was a critical theory, that is, traditions must be dismantled, the patriarchy must go away, everything of the old guard must be eradicated, we must have completely upended history and turned it into anarchy so that we can bring about our new, wonderful ideas that will unite the world. We have to tear down all the norms. In order to get there, the first step in all of that is for people to see themselves as victims, for people to see themselves as oppressed. You see, you can't have a melting pot, a colorblind group of people who all rally around the same virtues, the same culture, the same ideas. No, you must have divided up people groups and they must fight against each other. There must be dissension. There must be mobs and rioting and fighting in the streets until the entire populace says, government help us, give us peace. That was Marx's ideas. By the way, you can read the blueprint. <laughs> he just said, this is how it has to go. And college professors teach young students the blueprint. And people think, we gotta change the world. There are no secrets here. And so the, the way to get about this division of the culture is to make everybody in a separate class feel like they are oppressed, like they are victims. If you are a victim class, you now have power. And you can band together with people you really disagree with on everything because you have power against the machine, the norms, the traditions, the patriarchy. So pick some abnormal thing some rebellious expression, some new expression of self and identity, some new emotional confusion. And when people look askance at you, when it goes against their traditions, when your parents are concerned, you're a hero. You're part of the revolution. You're part of the remaking of society that's gonna throw off the shackles of tradition. It's gonna throw off the, the bondage of the patriarchy. And so all of these victim class oppressed peoples of aberrant views become the new heroes. Their aberrant behaviors are not merely tolerated, they must be universally celebrated. Again, those views are located at their very identity. How dare you criticize who they are at the core? Now they're oppressed. Now they're victims and so therefore now they are Marx's heroes. How you feel about yourself must not merely be tolerated by everybody, but acknowledged and rejoiced in by everybody. 
And if you add to all of these philosophers the whole idea of therapy, what Carl Truman calls the rise of the therapeutic, the idea that we need to go and, and fix these things, if myself is threatened because I can't give free rein to my self-expression, I need therapy. Not therapy to learn to be selfless, <laughs> to be humble, to think about other people and to glorify God. I need therapy, meaning I need help getting true to my authentic self and being able to express it without being oppressed, which means the therapy is aimed at society. Who must yield? The, the, the all-important king self that must be free to express every aberrant thing self wants to express? Or the rest of y'all must bow the knee to king self? Of course, in this cultural milieu, we're not worried about mutual contradiction. Some are. I mean, the fem feminists are upset that the, the gay agenda has overrun their turf. And then the gay agenda is offended that the transgender movement has overrun their turf. It just seems bizarre that nobody knows who they are anymore, and so the very clearly defined rights of certain groups just sort of evaporate. This mutually contradictory soup. This therapy is interesting. It's a focus on the self, Everybody has their introspective search for their own identity, and, and we all need help to make the self be true. But what used to be seen as a psychiatric disorder, why does that person have a, a penchant for dressing up in the other gender's clothing? That used to be treated as, as something out of order. It was now embraced. It's an affirmed identity. It must not be treated. It must be rewarded. Traditional society is what must be treated, corrected, canceled, or punished. Since the individual is king, he must not be made to conform to society. Society itself must conform to the self. It must be healed. All of us must learn to bow to the whims of individual expression. D.A. Carson has pointed out that tolerance used to mean, I think you have bad ideas, but I'm not going to kill you for it. I, I tolerate your bad ideas. The word tolerance has changed meanings in the last couple of decades. It now means I have to agree with you. And, and tolerance, meaning I thought you had bad ideas, but you know what? We're all growing together. Now means a forced agreement to bad ideas. Puts all of our culture in the scenario of the emperor with no clothes. Do you remember the story? The emperor had no clothes, had a, uh, a seamster, seamstress, seamer, what do you call a, any rate, tailor, that's the word I was looking for, had a tailor who convinced him that he had the most magnificent apparel, and if he just went out in it, he would be celebrated by the masses. And then, of course, all the yes men and the, 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 the army of the emperor went out and told the people, the emperor has the most extravagant new clothes. They are beautiful, very expensive, and we must all agree they are wonderful. And the emperor came out in his underwear. And the sane people all of a sudden think that they're the insane people because the crowd has gone along with the emperor and everybody's saying, oh, aren't they wonderful? Aren't those clothes wonderful? Do you see the radiant colors? They're purple. No, they're green. Yeah, yes, whatever. They, they're great. And everybody knows he's naked. And part of, the, part of the strategy of Karl Marx was not just to tell lies, but to tell such bold lies that everybody knew was lies, because if you get the populace to go along with what they know is a lie, you can control them in anything. Listen, if the entire population can say, the emperor has beautiful clothes, and they know he doesn't, you have absolute tyrannical control of the population. This is why truth is so critical in our day. And listen, it takes great courage. We've had as a debate, what, what will Christians do who, who give services to the general population? 
they make wedding cakes, they do photography, they rent facilities or host websites. What happens when somebody wants to have a gay wedding? Must a Christian fulfill that customer request? It, it now becomes an obligation. If you supply this product to anybody and everybody, you must endorse a gay wedding. You must provide your services. Again, Truman says this, it is not enough that I can buy a wedding cake somewhere in town if I'm gay and want to get married. I must be able to buy a wedding cake from each and every baker in town who ever caters for weddings. That's the demand. If we put all of this philosophical train together, we might summarize it this way. You are what you feel you are. And you can be you without reference to God. And your sexuality is your identity. And you are a victim being oppressed by those who disagree with you. And the solution is society must change. They must embrace you and celebrate you as you express yourself. That's where we are today. And like a crocodile you raised in your living room, this didn't just come out of nowhere. This has been growing and percolating and now emerging with devastating results. It's been a long train. I want to give you a second explanation. We'll leave the world of philosophy and we'll enter the world of wisdom. Can we do that? Turn to Romans chapter 1. Nothing new under the sun. We have in Romans chapter 1 a picture of the downward spiral of man's thoughts leading to judgment, leading to further thoughts, leading to judgment, leading to more aberrant behaviors. This is a downward spiral of judicial hardening and divine abandonment. And we're going to follow this path this morning is the second part of our discussion on transgenderism. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where language itself is assaulted so we can't use words anymore? Words take on the meanings of the self-expressive use of whoever wants to use them however they want to use them. And I would contend when, when our very vehicles of human language are destroyed, uh, we have little hope for common ground. There is a radical polarization of ideas because we don't even use the word woman the same way with each other in our society. I want you to see how this comes about. Paul says for us in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed, present tense. This is not the future wrath of God and eternal judgment. This is a present activity of God against something. Against what? Verse 18, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Step one in the progression here is invested truth suppression. By truth suppression, we mean something like that truth which God has made accessible, accessible and evident to every human being, universally, God's natural revelation, that is what can be known about God in the created order, His creativity, His power, His divine attributes being clearly understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Every man on the planet who's ever lived without excuse because of God the Creator putting His creation on display. And then God's internal witness in the human heart. God has placed in every human heart a knowledge of himself. Furthermore, God has placed a knowledge of right and wrong in every human heart. Paul goes on to describe this in Romans chapter 2. Gentiles who do not have the Old Testament do by nature the things required by it. They are law unto themselves. God gives witness in the eternal con internal constitution of the human heart that there are categories of right and wrong. Now, of course, none of that knowledge, internal witness, the conscience, knowledge of God's existence, or the external witness of creation, none of those are enough to save a sinner from his sin, but they are enough to condemn. Because what man does with that knowledge, according to verse 18, is suppress 
the truth. The truth is out there. What does sinful man do in unrighteousness? He bundles it all up. He stuffs it in a box. He closes the lid on the crate, nails the lid shut, and sits on top of it. And he says, there is no truth. There is no universe. There is no creator. And the astronomer looking through the telescope and the lab tech looking through the microscope deny what they see with their eyes. And every sinful human being stuffs in a box the voice of conscience. This is the activity of sinful man. We were all born in this condition. We all did this very thing. Verse 21 says, Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God nor give thanks. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What is the result of truth suppression? You get stupid. You just don't think straight. When you choose not to think God's thoughts after Him, you, you choose to replace God's ways of thinking with your own sinful ways of thinking, untrustworthy ways of thinking, incomplete ways of thinking, finite ways of thinking. You see, we're crippled at every level. We don't know everything. We don't know everything we think we know. And the things we do know, we know the wrong way and for the wrong reasons. We should not trust ourselves. And when we do trust ourselves, trust our own knowledge, we become independent epistemologists. That means we, we try to get our knowledge away from God, all on our own. We become fools with dark hearts. Professing to be wise, verse 22, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. When man rejects God, <clears throat> he's still built as a worshiper. He worships something. You worship self, you worship money, uh, you worship sticks and rocks or your ancestors or some made-up deity or demons or Satan himself or some athlete. We worship, but we exchange the glory of, the God, of God, the one true God, with anything under the sun. Look at verse 24. Therefore, see that therefore? This is step two in the downward cycle. Uh, this is judgment. Therefore, God gave them over. Um, who's the one doing the activity in verse 24? God is. Those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness became fools. God gave them over to something. Listen, when you say, I don't want God, and God says, okay, I'll give you what you want, not me. Look what God gave them over to in verse 24. God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And then verse 25, notice the exchange. We saw the exchange of the glory of God for man-made things in verse 23. Now they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. Here in verse 24, sexual lust and perversion is a judgment from God for the rejection of his truth. You don't want God's truth? Great, I'll give you over to the lusts of your heart. And you will exchange truth for a lie. Can you think of some examples? What is truth? Sex is good? In marriage, as God designed, it's beautiful and is a matter of worship. Exchange that. I don't want that. I want lies. Liberation from God. Sex as recreational activity. Do whatever I want, however I want, with whomever I want, whenever I want. And they exchange God's beautiful truth for ugly, deceptive, destructive lies. What tragedy. And, and this is a judgment from God. Notice the four in verse 26. This leads to another step. After, I'd rather have sin than the truth. <laughs> I'd rather have instant gratification than what's real. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. Again, who's doing the activity? God is doing the activity. 
that those who have exchanged the truth of God for folly and then exchanged the truth of God's gifts for lies, God now gives them over to that which degrades, degrading passions. In other words, the sexual perversion moves into the unnatural. And, and you see the description there. Men with men, women, women with women. Homosexuality is a judgment of God against humanity made in his image. It is not the identity of any human. It is a judgment of God giving rebellious humans over to further darkness. And then look at verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over, there's that phrase again, to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Again, men rejected the truth, suppressed the truth. God gave them over to folly. That folly led to sexual perversion. That perversion led to unnatural expressions of sexuality those things which actually degrade humanity. And all of that leads in God's judgment to a giving over to a depraved mind, a, a brain that just doesn't work right. It, it has turned everything upside down. Right is wrong, wrong is right. All categories are, are flipped. And then you get this, the bottom of the barrel here, description of all of the results of societal breakdown as a result of God's judgment. Listen, verse 29, they are filled, filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil. Notice again, they are full, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers. By the way, gossip and slander just seems like normal human language now. It's the newspapers, it's our entertainment, it's how we talk about each other. It, this is a full of wickedness thing. They're haters of God. Insolent, insolent, boy, combine insolent and arrogant. <laughs> Boastful, inventors of evil. I thought you said there was nothing new under the sun. Well, there are new variations on the same old stuff. Disobedient to parents. Look, every one of you disobeyed your parents. I get that. I think what Paul has in mind here is a fullness of childhood rebellion that is marking a society given over by God to depravity. And I think we're experiencing that in remarkable ways. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. I like the NIV here. They're faithless, heartless, ruthless, worthless. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Listen to the last description of this societal breakdown. They know it's wrong. They still have the internal categories of right and wrong. And, and as much as they want to rewrite the conscience and sear the conscience and tell everybody the emperor's clothes are great, they know he's naked. but they have to pat each other on the back and say, you're okay, right? I'm okay, right? I, I, can, I can be the, the authentic expression of myself and my perversion, right? And, and if you're perverted and I'm perverted, then we're all okay. And, and who is God to judge all of us because we're all in the same boat together? I mean, my God would never be so cruel as to punish all of us. He loves us, right? And there's this hearty approval of activity, even coming from so-called Christian circles. For every kind of perversion that is actually a mark of the judgment of God against our rebellious society. Let's talk solutions. Number one, believe and preach the gospel. You know Romans 1. Paul said in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
We should be ashamed if we're not proclaiming the gospel. We should be ashamed of any lesser solution, any phony solution, any Marxian solution or Freudian solution. But we can absolutely boast in the gospel. Paul penned this in an era in his own day that was much like the moral climate of our own. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why, Paul? Because in it is the righteousness of God for salvation, for Jew and Gentile. Why is there power in the gospel for salvation? Because in the gospel, he goes on to say in verse 17, is the righteousness of God, a righteousness freely provided to all who will access it by faith in Jesus Christ. Which means, fundamentally, the solution to this is not how do we fix society, but if you're here this morning and you're wrestling with transgenderism or homosexuality or perversion of any sort, recognize where it comes from, why it's there, it is in the heart and it is a result of our society and the judgment of God and Satan's deception all bundled up into one and you can be rescued from it. You can be rescued from it by the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Why? Because the gospel provides a righteousness you could never get on your own. You couldn't clean yourself up on your own. You couldn't fix your inclinations on your own. But God can, and God will. Surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be a new creature set free from slavery to sin, forgiven of every crime you've committed against your creator, and instantly experiencing new life. You gotta believe the gospel. You gotta preach the gospel. By the way, why do we need the righteousness of God provided in the gospel, verse 17? Notice the connection in verse 18. Because the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Do you see the chain here? That downward spiral of degradation we just talked through is all subordinated under, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel saves, because the gospel provides righteousness and you need righteousness because wrath, because the world's in trouble. And we have to believe and preach the gospel. A second solution is we need to cling to truth. Nothing new under the sun the truth will never be surprised by some new lie, some new trend, some new fad that the truth can't just deal with. The truth stands forever. God's truth stands forever. God made us. He knows us. He knows what we're like, and he gave us the answers we need. By the way, this is a great time to uphold truth. Do you know that, Christian? We've sort of been comfortable living as Christians. The 20th century, it was like kind of cool to go to church. Everybody went to church pretty much. It was kind of shameful if you got divorced. Do you know that Barack Obama ran on a platform of marriage is between a man and a woman? That was his presidential platform. That was like yesterday, wasn't it? It used to be easy to uphold truth, but it was hard to tell who was a Christian. If everybody goes to church, there were lots of people that went to church that didn't know Christ. Right now is a great time when the whole world is saying, the emperor's clothes are beautiful, and everybody goes, I think he's naked, but I can't say it out loud. To just say, yeah, he has no clothes, let's talk. I got the truth right here. You have truth? I thought truth didn't exist. I thought that was in a galaxy far, far away, long ago. I said that backwards. No, we have truth. This is a great season to be proclaiming the truth because the world has convinced itself it doesn't exist. A third solution here is persistent resistance. I mean by that what Paul says in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, to, to obey God's command here, to not be squeezed into the pattern of this world. Pour ice, or you pour water into an ice cube tray, it takes on the form of the tray. You pour the Christian into the world's ice cube tray, you should look different. <laughs> Don't be conformed. It takes active resistance. 
It takes active, disciplined renewal of your mind. How do you get that? Be born again and read God's word. You got to think God's thoughts after him. Our culture will normalize aberrant behavior and the word of God will renormalize you. It's tragic to watch the church's response to the world. The, the world has been slowly going off a cliff and now it's like edge of the cliff, whoosh, lemming to the bottom of the fjord. And typically the church is just kind of trailed, just maybe a, a little bit behind the world, but doing some of the same stuff the world does, just not quite as cool. We've just been conforming. Like lemmings, we're headed off a cliff. Wake up, take the smelling salts, realize, oh, this world is going crazy. It takes active disconformity, a persistent resistance to the world's pressures. And then finally, we must be those who are about compassionate rescue. Compassionate rescue. You know your job description. This comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 18. God reconciled us to himself through Christ. Do you remember it, Christian? You were the world. You were part of the system. You were under satanic blinding. You were a perpetrator and a victim. You were in rebellion against God. You were in darkness. And God reconciled you. He saved you. He forgave your sins, made you a new creature. And verse 18 says, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is our view to a world around us? Confused? Confused victim perpetrators? Compassion, love, prayer, evangelism. The world misdefines love. If you're gonna love them, you have to celebrate who they are and their authentic self. No, no, no. To love them means to speak truth. But to do so as one who was an enemy of truth and who has been rescued. To do so with compassion and genuine love and patience and prayer. Let us be so in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for rescuing us from the darkness that we were from the confusion that we would be even to this day. We thank you for the bright beacon of your word, for its clarity, for its transformative power. We lament over the state of the world around us and yet it is a good reminder of what it means to belong to you and to not belong to this world. And oh God, until you take us out of this world, send us into it. Let us not be conformed to it but let us be in it as proclaimers of your good gospel which will save anyone who turns. And we ask that you'd use us to that end in Jesus' name. Amen.